Amen. Amen. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that our long-expected Jesus has come. He is here. He has risen. He is alive. And he has rescued us. We thank you, Father, for the work, for the ministry, for the person of Jesus Christ who did it all. You accomplished everything in and through our lives. And you have rescued us from the enemy. And you are rescuing us. And you will completely deliver us from all things for your sake, for your glory. We ask you to open our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to hear your word tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Short scripture tonight. Verses 13, 14. He, Christ Jesus, has delivered us. Has, past tense. He has, you get it? He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It was a rescue mission, a rescue mission. We have been delivered. Now, if you, you ask the, the normal person on the street what they think about God, you, you're going to get a lot of different answers. Ask, him, ask them what they believe about themselves to be a good person. And I would say the majority, probably 80, 90% of the people will, will answer that, yeah, yeah, they're comparatively better than the next person. After all, they never murdered anyone. But one question might stop them dead in their tracks. Try this question. What do you do with your guilt? What do you do with your guilt. Most people are aware of their guilt when they do something against their conscience. Guilt has plagued the human race since Adam and Eve fell into sin. The various ways of, of trying to get rid of guilt are so numerous that it would almost be funny if, if guilt were a laughing matter, which it is not. Well, look at Adam and Eve. They attempted to cover their guilt with fig leaves cover up your sin and casually pretend that there's no problem. But when we face a holy God while wearing fig leaves, it ends only in desperation and guilt is piled on top of guilt. What about this one? You've heard this one, the famous blame game, blame another person or even blame God himself. When God confronted Adam with his sin, Adam blamed both his wife and God by saying, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate it. <laughs> parents, parents know that their children are born with this technique firmly in place, ready to use at the, the first twinge of guilt, but we tend to keep using it as adults. We are prone to blame one another for our own sin, our own guilt, in a vain attempt to cover it up. Another technique is rationalization. We think it's not that bad. After all, everyone else is doing it. It's, it's just a, a little sin, a, a mistake. It's, a, it's an error in judgment. We'll even tend to attack the person making the accusation. After all, you do the very same thing that you're accusing me of, right? Who are you to talk? Who, you're not Mr. Perfect. Or we tend to accuse God of being unfair or unloving, but we refuse to admit that we are the ones at fault. Still others deal with guilt by comparing themselves to others who are worse than they are. Yeah, yeah, sure, I get angry, but I'm not like those terrorists blowing up innocent people. Often this approach is coupled with balancing out their guilt by saying that they're a basically good person or they have a good heart. A worse approach is simply to deny your guilt by arguing that there is no such thing. 
These folks go to a psychologist who doesn't believe in God, and he assures them that guilt is not real. Modern psychology attempts to erase guilt rather than dealing with it and focusing rather on self-esteem. Feel good about yourself. But that's not the crucial question. The crucial question is this. How can I really be forgiven by God? How can I know that when I stand before him someday, my sins will be covered? We need to answer that question carefully by viewing God as he revealed himself in his word, not by how our society may conceive him to be. Our culture commonly views God as this good buddy in the sky who maybe not, he might not like sin, but he's never going to judge it because he's a God of love. We have to understand, yes, God is a God of love, but God is also a God of justice. And if he's not a God of justice, then he's not a God of love. If that's how we really God is, then we don't need to worry about our sins and we can just shrug off those guilt feelings. But if God is holy and he has a settled wrath against all sin, then our guilt is real and we must deal with our guilt in God's way. Since we have all sinned many times and many ways, we all need to clearly understand how can I be forgiven by God. Well, Paul gives us an answer right here in Colossians chapter 1. In the context, he is sharing the content of his prayer for these relatively new believers whom he had never seen. He prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will so that they would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, pleasing him in all respects. One aspect of pleasing him is to give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. Verses 13 and 14 then sum up the greatest of these blessings that in Christ the Father has rescued us. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to Christ's kingdom where we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. So what is the solution to guilt? It is to be completely, totally, absolutely forgiven by God. We're not talking about a feeling. We're not talking about subjectivism. We're talking about a redemptive historical fact, an objective fact that if you are in Christ, you are totally, absolutely forgiven. And in the words of our precious violinist, we are forgiven 959%. Amen. We are forgiven. No guilt, no shame. So what is Paul's main point? Yes, God will bring every work into judgment, every secret thing, whether it be good or evil. Paul's main point is this. To be forgiven by God, we must see our desperate condition and lay hold of God's only solution. Well, aren't you narrow-minded? Do you really think that Jesus is the only way? Praise God that he provided a way to be forgiven. He did not have to provide any way, but he has provided the way of forgiveness, of deliverance. He has done it, and he has accomplished it all in Jesus Christ. So Paul will be, look at two points. We'll look at two points in these verses very quickly. To be forgiven by God, we must see our desperate condition. If we are not in the kingdom of God's Son, we are under the authority of darkness. There's only two choices. We're either in Christ, 
delivered from the domain of darkness and transferred to the kingdom of his beloved son, or we are in Adam. We are under the authority of darkness. We are sons and daughters of the evil one because God takes us out of that family and adopts us into his. Clearly, Paul saw only two possibilities, either in the kingdom of God's beloved son or under the authority of darkness. There's, there's no middle ground. There's no halfway Christian. There's no partway Christian. Well, I'm trying to be a Christian. Either you are in the kingdom of darkness or you're in the kingdom of light. There's only two choices. Now, Paul's reference to the kingdom is a group of people ruled by a king. This is more than just the future earthly millennial kingdom. This everlasting kingdom speaks of the realm of salvation in which all believers live in current and eternal spiritual relationship with the son he loves as an expression of eternal love. We are under the authority of Christ Jesus. This is the kingdom that the Father gave to Jesus, the Son that he loves. This is an expression, a total expression of the love of, of the Father. Yes, there is only one way, but praise God, there is a way. That means that every person the Father calls and justifies is a love gift from him to the Son. I, I read an article. I'm, I'm going to find that arc, article and, and post it in here when I find it. You know, we see this, this picture of the incarnation of Christ coming into this world. We see a beautiful little baby, a beautiful little stable, uh, quiet little angels hovering over above, this quiet, peaceful, joyful thing. And yes, it was a joyful thing, but guess what? It was a battle. God came to defeat the dragon, and he came to rescue his bride. That's what Christmas is about. It is the end of the kingdom of darkness and the coming of the kingdom of light. Christ Jesus coming into the world to rescue his bride. And that is what he has done for us. Amen. Paul is talking about the present form of Christ's kingdom, where he is king over all who have submitted to his rightful lordship. Where is, I ask my grandchildren this question all the time, where is Jesus right now? And they'll say, he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father. I said, what is Jesus doing right now? He's interceding for us. He's praying for us. He's ruling and reigning over all heaven and earth. They got it. They understand it. The idea that you can believe in Jesus as your savior, but wait until later to submit to him as your Lord, that's, that's completely foreign to the Bible understanding. You are right now under the lordship of Jesus Christ. We are under his dominion in his kingdom. And these references point to the eternal relationship of love between the Father and the Son, and to the fact that Jesus is the only one whom God sent who could save us from our sins through his death on the cross. He is the perfect God-man, perfectly human, perfectly divine. The term here emphasizes the contrast between being in Satan's evil domain of darkness versus being in God's kingdom where we are placed in Christ. The supreme object, the supreme expression of God's love. Paul is echo echoing here what the risen Lord Jesus had said to him on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 26. He said, when, when Paul was confronted by Jesus, he said, who are you, Lord? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you 
from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may, what? Turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. You see, darkness is exemplified in the in the Bible in several places. Ephesians 4 says, says talks about those that are outside of Christ, that they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's a good one, uh, Canadian Matthew. Yes, Paul Washer definitely teaches. It's, it's a package deal. Jesus is our king. He is our savior, but he is also our Lord. There's no such thing as a separate lordship salvation. It's very, very sad. Totally agree with that. So darkness in the Bible can represent a number of unfavorable conditions, and it can refer to spiritual ignorance. That ignorance being just not knowing, not realizing, just as blind people are total darkness and cannot do anything to see, so spiritually blind people are unable to see the light of the gospel. They are unwilling, they are unable to come to Christ unless God opens their blind eyes by his sovereign electing grace. But darkness also pictures sin. We see in John 3, I think I've got it here, there it is. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. That is what darkness does in our lives. Even worse, there is a malevolent evil being being behind the pervasive spiritual ignorance and sin. Thus, darkness is also representative of Satan's domain, as in our text. So the picture of the world apart from Jesus Christ is desperate. It is hopeless. It is Unbelievers are spiritually ignorant. Ephesians says that they are dead. They are excluded from the life of God because of the hardness of their hearts. They love their sin and they do not want to come to the light where their evil deeds would be exposed. And they're under the domination of the world forces of this darkness headed by the evil one himself. And the startling thing is that there is no middle ground. People are either in the kingdom of Jesus Christ under his lordship, or they are in Satan's domain of darkness under his authority. And, and we're talking about relatively nice, good people. Many of them are faithful to their mates. They love their children. They hold down responsible jobs. They, they're good neighbors. They're good citizens. They're not lawbreakers. Many are church members, but they are in Satan's domain of darkness. So to move from the authority of darkness to the kingdom of God's son, God must rescue us and transfer us to that radically different kingdom. For God to rescue us implies that we cannot rescue ourselves. The powerful enemy over the realm of darkness and our spiritual blindness combine to render us spiritually helpless to pull off our own rescue. Remember Ephesians, we, are, we were dead in sins, dead people 
cannot raise themselves. In fact, until the Lord opens our eyes, we don't even know that we need rescuing. God alone has the power to overcome the evil prince of darkness and pull off such a rescue. Think of the modern terrorist movement. This, this has given us a graphic picture of what it means to live under the authority of darkness. When terrorists kidnap a victim, they usually take him blindfolded to a location where he is totally lost. So even if he escaped, he wouldn't know which way to run. They sometimes keep him blindfolded for days, chained to a wall in some bare room. He's not free to come and go. He's cut off from family and friends and in a weird psychological condition known as the Stockholm Syndrome. Some terrorist victims begin to sympathize with and even defend their captors. Isn't that just like those who are held captive by the evil one to do his will? They're lost, they're blinded, they're dead, enslaved to Satan, free only to do what he wants them to do. They cannot follow God because they're chained by their sins. Those chains of sin often alienate them from family and friends as relationships are strained and severed. They're miserable, unable to live as God created them to live. And yet, when you talk to them about Christ and the freedom he offers, they defend their evil captor in spite of the misery he has brought upon them. Amen. Yes, Lydia. I remember the story. Lydia. What happened to Lydia? The Lord opened her heart to pay attention. If you go back and read Acts 16, there's no altar call. You won't find it. God supernaturally opened Lydia's heart and she believed. There was a change wrought about in Lydia, not by Lydia, not by Paul, but by the Spirit of God. So spiritually, salvation is not a human operation. We cannot rescue lost sinners. They can't rescue themselves. Only God can rescue lost sinners. Look at the the allusion to salvation is found in Exodus 6 when God speaks to Moses about the people of Israel. This is what he says to them. Say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That's rescue. I will deliver you from slavery. That's bringing them out of bondage. I will redeem you. That's purchasing back from the marketplace of sin with an outstretched arm with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. That's adoption. That's what God does for us. And I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. That's regeneration, giving them an giving them a circumcised heart to know their God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Salvation is totally and completely of the Lord from start to finish. We have been saved. We are being saved, and we will ultimately be saved. He is the sovereign Lord over all of his creation. He is the one who rescues. He is the one who saves. He is the one who redeems us and transfers us from the kingdom of darkness to his glorious kingdom of light. This is to say simply that salvation is belongs to the Lord. It is not due to self-effort. It is not even a joint effort. It is God's doing totally. Look what Charles Spurgeon says. I must say that the doctrine which leaves salvation to the creature 
and tells him that it depends upon himself is the exaltation of the flesh and a dishonoring of God. But that which puts in God's hand, but that which puts in God's hand man fallen man and tells man that though he has destroyed himself, yet his salvation must be of God, that doctrine humbles man in the very dust, and then he is just in the right place to receive the grace and mercy of God. When God opens the eyes of sinners to see their desperate condition and that he alone can save them, all they can do is to cry out to him for mercy, for forgiveness. Amen. Second point, to be forgiven by God, we must lay hold of God's only exclusive solution. God's only solution involves redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now, when we, we hear the word redemption, we immediately think in religious terms, but the average person in the first century heard the word redemption and thought in non-religious terms. It applied especially to the release of prisoners of war by paying of a ransom or to the freeing of a slave through the paying of a price. In the Old Testament, property, animals, persons, and even the nation, the nation of Israel, were all redeemed by the payment of a price. There was always a decisive and costly intervention. Someone paid the price necessary to free property from mortgage, animals from slaughter, and persons from slavery, even from death. A perfect picture of this is the book of Ruth. If you go back and read the book of Ruth, Boaz was a type of Christ Jesus who redeemed Ruth and brought her out of her bondage. So in the case of our redemption from slavery to sin and to Satan, the price was the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus' blood means his death. He died as a substitute for sinners, paying the penalty that we deserved the penalty that God had decreed upon sin, the penalty and enduring the wrath of God that we deserved in our place. He paid the penalty that we deserve. Now, if you read through the 13 letters of Paul, you find that it, it's interesting. He doesn't use the word forgiveness very often, but here he uses he used it because the Lord used it on the road to Damascus. It means, forgiveness means to release from debt. We owed a debt that we could not pay. Christ paid a debt that he did not owe. So in the case of our sins, God releases us because Christ paid the debt through his shed blood. Thus, God is free to be both just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I mentioned at the beginning, God is love. Yes, God is love, but God is also just. If he were not just, then he would not be loving. So he has offered perfect justice through Jesus Christ. Justice has been satisfied and we are free in Christ. We lay hold of God's redemption and forgiveness by trusting in the Lord Jesus and his death for us. Amen. Just how we were born into this world without our works or effort or will, but through our parents' will. So it is our supernatural birth by God's will. Uh, another question I asked the grandchildren, I said, uh, did you choose where you were going to be born, to whom you were going to be born? When were you going to be born? They all had the right answers. It's such a pleasure to teach them. So as, as, as the Lord told Paul, and as he proclaimed the gospel to the Gentiles, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith.
faith. Redemption and forgiveness are in Christ. By trusting in him, we receive all of those benefits which he obtained when he died and rose again. We can't do anything to earn it. We can't earn, we can't merit God's redemption and forgiveness. There is no treasury of merit in heaven laid up for us as the Catholics like to teach. There is no treasury. We can't earn it. We can't merit. We don't deserve it. It's all of sheer unmerited favor and grace. We can't do penance. We can't build up merit. We can't do good works. We never can fill up the coffer of good works because Christ did it all. And as the author of Hebrews makes clear, the Old Testament sacrifices could never take away sins, but Christ offered one sacrifice for all times and obtained eternal redemption. As a result, the assurance God gives us to all who believe is their sins, their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Praise be to his glorious name. We have been delivered. We have been rescued. Praise to our glorious God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So when we trust in Christ Jesus, when we trust in his sacrifice on the cross, it's the only way to know that God has forgiven our sins. Amen. Just a few conclusions, applications. The cross is the greatest emancipation proclamation ever declared. We were held in captivity. We were blind. We were dead by the enemy power. In fact, you were born, you and I were born into slavery. But you, like every person we mentioned at the outset, we, you have, by grace, through faith, you have been set free. How? Because a ransom was paid, a ransom that makes $60 billion look like a drop in the bucket. You were freed because another took your place, because Christ died as a payment for your freedom. So we look to Jesus, we look away from ourselves, and we see a ransom that both reminds us of the horrors of our bondage and the goodness of our freedom. And we learn to give thanks in all things. Psalm 107, oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed. He has rescued us from trouble. Second conclusion, since we have been redeemed, rescued, delivered, it will motivate us to live differently each day of our lives. You are no longer a slave to sin, to its dictates. Yes, we still sin, but we are no longer held in bondage to sin. You are no longer in bondage to the fear of death. You are no longer shackled by a guilty conscience. You are no longer bound to live for yourself. You have been set free. So let us learn to live in that freedom. Third conclusion, consider the cost of that freedom and let it inspire humility, gratefulness, and worship in your heart. Good doctrine, good theology must lead to worship. We must bow before our creator. We must bow our knees to our savior with grateful hearts, with contrite hearts, Thank you, thanking him for what he has done. Let God fill your heart with hope. Why? Because even though our redemption has been secured, it has not yet been fully realized. And he will complete what he has begun in you and in me. He is faithful to the end. Your salvation is guaranteed. 
freedom now from the power and penalty of sin. And one day, I can't wait for that day because I hate my sin so deeply. Freedom from the very presence of sin. We will see him face to face and we will be free from the very presence of sin. What more can stir our hearts to worship? And we can sing along with the old hymn that says this, Praise my soul, the King of heaven. To his feet your tribute bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, who like me his praise should sing. Praise him, praise him, praise him, praise him. Praise the everlasting King. Amen. Let us ever praise our King. Well, I'm going to play you a couple Christmas songs to close us out as we enter into the season. I'll have a couple new ones for you each week as we move along into this Christmas season. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mario, you are so on the money. Yeah. This this mindset. Yeah, it's 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 a gradual development. You know, I, 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 I've been on this. I won't say how many years. Uh, I, I remember my mindset being totally opposite of anything I might say today. And even even today, I struggle. I struggle with thoughts. I struggle with things. I struggle with being thankful. You know, there's things that we struggle with because we are in this flesh and we are still not under the power of sin, but we are still in our flesh and we are not freed from the presence of sin. So we continue, yes, pray, continue to set me free from myself, right? That is the greatest freedom that we need is to be set free. So I invite you to sing along with me as I play just a couple of songs for you. Let us adore him, let us thank him, and let us live to glorify our King. Amen. Well, let's close with...
I can get back in the room. <laughs> Amen. Let's close with prayer. Father, Heavenly Father, we thank you, gracious God, that you have rescued us, that you have rescued us from sin, from guilt, from shame, that you have brought us out. You have brought us out of the kingdom of darkness, that you have brought us into your marvelous kingdom of light. Help us to live every day, to glorify your name, to praise you, to live before you humbly and gracious thanks for what you have done. Let every part of our lives reflect your glory for your goodness. May you be glorified in us and through us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being here, and it's always a privilege. I will be back next Tuesday, same time, same channel. May God bless the remainder of your day. Amen. Thanks.